Thank you all so much for joining us for an Olano webinar. I'm Gracie Mills, Education Manager at the Olano Partnership. Before we get started, I just want to give a special thanks to you all for joining us here on Zoom, especially to our members whose continuous support is a vital part of what makes programs like this possible at Olana. Thank you. You can become a member and join upcomers member, upcoming members only events by visiting olana.org slash membership. We have numerous upcoming public programs this season and you can learn more on our website at olana.org slash programs dash events. Join us for a virtual volunteer information session on Thursday, March 30th from 4 to 5 p.m. to learn more about open volunteer opportunities at Olana, the work we do, and the many ways you can get involved. Visit our website to register and learn more. You can also join us on site in celebrating Arbor Day at Olana on Saturday, April 29th from 12 to 4 p.m during an afternoon of drop-in activities, music, workshops, and walking tours throughout our forested landscape. There will also be a giveaway of free tree saplings for the first 100 visitors. So stop by, join in the fun, and you can learn more at olana.org slash arborday. Additionally, this weekend is your last chance to see Chasing Icebergs, Art and a Disappearing Landscape at Olana, and you can purchase tickets to view this exhibition on our website. And mark your calendars for our next exhibition, Terraforming, Olana's Historic Photography Collection, Unearthed, opening May 14th. Now, before we get started, a few notes on Zoom. As an attendee, your sound and video will remain off throughout this webinar. Please use the Q&A functions to ask questions of our speakers. You're welcome to ask questions throughout the webinar and during the conversation that will follow um, our artist talk this evening, but we will not answer them until the final portion of the program. You can move our speaker's image during the talk if the image is covering the PowerPoint by clicking the back bar above their picture and dragging it. If you're having any issues with your Zoom today, please contact me at gmills at olana.org, and I will also be available in, for any troubleshooting in the chat function. Now, please join me in welcoming the moderator for tonight, Carolyn Keough, Director of Education and Public Programs for the Olana Partnership, who will be introducing tonight's speakers. Thanks so much, Gracie. I'm so excited to introduce our speakers and our conversationalists tonight. So we'll be joined this evening by Mark Igloliorte, who is an INAC interdisciplinary artist and educator from Nunat Siavit Laboratory. His artistic work is primarily painting and drawing, and he received a Bachelor of Education from Memorial University, his BFA from the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, and his MFA from Concordia University. His work has been shown nationally and internationally, notably at the, Muse at the Musée National des Beaux-Arts, I do not speak French, in Quebec, among others. His work is currently included in Chasing Icebergs, Art and a Disappearing Landscape on view at Alana State Historic Site until March 26. Francesca Hebert Spence currently resides in Ottawa and is Anish Anishinaabe from Winnipeg, Manitoba. Her grandmother, Marion Ida Spence, was from Say King, First Nation, on Lake Winnipeg, Manitoba. She is a PhD student in cultural mediations at Carleton University, exploring the presence of guest host protocols within Indigenous methodological practices, with a focus on visual art in Canada. Francesca curated a display of Mark's work last summer at the University of Winnipeg Art Gallery. I'm looking forward to having both Mark and Francesca join us in conversation tonight on the occasion of Chasing Icebergs. As, as Gracie mentioned, this exhibition is closing this coming Sunday, so please, if you haven't, um, come by and get in before the exhibition ends. As you may know, the exhibit traces 19th century artist Frederick Church's travels through Newfoundland and Labrador, and the studies and depictions that resulted from this journey. As an artist native to Labrador, we're so fortunate to have Mark's work on display as part of the show, lending a vital contemporary voice to the topic of Arctic landscapes. And I am especially thrilled to have him here tonight to provide us with a deeper insight into how landscape and indigeneity and language has informed his own practice. 
To ground our conversation, Mark will give a short presentation of his work before entering into dialogue with Francesca, after which we'll invite viewers to submit their questions for an open Q&A to close out our program this evening. So Mark, please join me and take it away. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, just gonna hit play on my uh, thing. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to uh, thank the Orlando Partnership for uh, having me. Um, oh, I better, I think I need to do the, the screen share a little bit differently. But um, yeah, before we get started, I want to thank the Orlando Partnership and uh, uh, Carolyn Keough and Gracie Mills uh, for uh, organizing this event and for including me in the exhibition. Uh, I'd really like to thank uh, Francesca Herbert Spence uh, uh, for uh, curating my show. Uh, Kanakiak at uh, um, the uh, the Winnipeg um, uh, University at Gallery C103 uh, or 1C03. Uh, it was uh, uh, really an honor to uh, work with her and to investigate uh, some of my older work and how it ties into more my more recent work. And uh, I'm really looking forward to our conversation after uh, giving my presentation. Okay, so I'm going to do a screen share again. Uh, and I just wanna make sure that I get the right things. Okay, here we go. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, the title of my work is, uh, or my presentation is Perspectives on Landscape, Language and Indigeneity. Uh, so I'd like to look at uh, each of these different um, subjects or uh, in relation to one another uh, and through the lens of my practice. Uh, just for some context, uh, there are four uh, Inuit self-governing regions uh, in Canada, uh, which overlay with uh, provincial and territorial uh, governments. And I am from Nunatsivut, uh, which is uh, on the eastern shore, eastern northern shore of Canada. Uh, and you can see the uh, Nunatsivut area here on your right uh, as part of Labrador. I grew up in Happy Valley Goose Bay, uh, which it was an American air base developed in World War II and uh, persists uh, as a community to today uh, with many different Indigenous people, uh, including uh, the Innu of Labrador uh, and the Inuit, uh, which are two very distinct uh, cultural groups. And my father's family uh, is from Hopedale. Uh, and uh, this is my grandmother, who was a uh, seamstress and also a very uh, talented embroiderer. Um, and uh, I included this image because one of the things that I appreciate about their depiction of children is uh, how they're uh, having so much kind of carefree play like out in the landscape. And um, there's a really lovely um, inclusion in an article that was in Canadian Art Magazine that doesn't exist in Canada anymore. Uh, but it just said something really lovely about um, uh, having these wonderful characters tumbling in the snowy landscape. And um, I like to think about uh, our relationship to land and being active outside as a, a big part of my practice. Um, I wanted to start with uh, the Kamatik or dog team sled, uh, which is an Inuit innov innovation uh, for traveling across the frozen uh, Arctic. Uh, and one of the amazing things about it is that it's been adapted from a dog team sled into uh, a sled that has essentially the same form uh, with slightly um, different materials uh, that is now a sled that people use with their snowmobiles and all still dog teams as well. Um, with this uh, sled, I wanted to do a project. And one of the fun things about it was that I got to involve my father who's in the lower right. And so here he's planning the, um, uh, the uh, runners of the sled in a particular way so it makes sense like when they're angled out onto the snow like this it's planed on, on an angle so that it's flat on each each side which adds stability to the sled and another important part of the sled is rather than using screws or nails which the the rigidity of that fastening like it doesn't work because of like the, when traveling across the landscape it 
it just kind of they just kind of rattle loose. And so the traditional way of latching the boards uh, through knot work to the uh, runners, uh, it persists to, to today. Uh, and here I'm at a uh, science camp, which I uh, led the organization for uh, when I was working for the government uh, for Indigenous youth. And so it was a fun way to kind of like have knowledge transfer between my father and I, and then from me to these youth uh, through this project. And what I did as part of an art festival in Prince Edward Island is I offered to have uh, portraits of people's dogs drawn. Uh, and so here we have a, a lab, which I think was funny, uh, attached to uh, the sled. And you can see that the dog owners here just love it. Um, and uh, it was fun for me to kind of set up and uh, make these drawings on uh, shrinky dink plastic. Uh, which I would um, like sketch onto and then shrink with the heat gun so that there would be like a crisp, memorable thing to give the uh, dog owners, art festival goers, uh, something to, to go away with. Uh, interestingly, uh, this is a sled dog that was a rescue from the north. And so it was interesting to kind of like do this dog's portrait uh, tethered once again to a uh, comic tick. Um, and this one might be my favorite from the day. Uh, it's a family, uh, a family's Pomeranian. And um, in what I'm trying to highlight here is that um, there's a, a really big difference between a domestic animal and uh, like a, um, uh, a work animal. Um, but still, uh, they're, they're both dogs in our relationship to non-humans, and like there's something kind of unique about, anybody who owns a dog will know, there's something very unique about that relationship. And uh, working with that relationship in this piece, I was able to kind of like talk about uh, things about how climate change is affecting uh, people in the North. A uh, very dark history in Canada's chapter, uh, a very dark chapter in Canada's history where uh, RCMP officers uh, round up and shot people's dogs and uh, kept Inuit uh, from accessing the land like they had before uh, and how that traumatic event, uh, event like affected um, the Inuit history in Canada. Um, and it's so it, it's like uh, a way for me to kind of like sit down and have a conversation with people while I'm doing the drawing. Uh, and it's like having that kind of like approach where I'm not making a portrait of the people, but I'm making a portrait of their dog. It kind of like makes them very active listeners and it makes the conversation really dynamic. And so uh, that was all part of this performance or part of this like offering. Um, so uh, I, I, um, growing up in Goose Bay, uh, I just went to like a, a NATO uh, school and I went to school with Americans and then uh, other people from uh, NATO forces. And uh, as much as I would like go and do hunting with my father and um, uh, like visit my extended family, including my Inuit family, I wasn't thinking so much about the cultural side of things in terms of expressing through my art. Like when I went to art school, uh, in over four years, I only encountered one article on uh, an Indigenous subject, like one essay for over four years. And that was the state of things in art school uh, a couple of decades ago. So going to the Banff Center, it was different because I was on a residency and uh, it was all Indigenous artists and they were all talking about uh, their backgrounds and sharing stories. And um, there were, uh, were some really influential people that were there uh, were influential to me. Uh, one of them was Cheryl Arondel uh, and their uh, former partner, Joseph Natauhau. And I remember like coming back from one of the sessions that they had led and I was just so inspired and thinking about how I'd like to combine my passion for skateboarding and snowboarding with my Inuit culture. And so um, like this is like the rough sketches I was making in my sketchbook like right after that night. Uh, and I wanted to do something with my last name Igloli Orti, uh, which equally means house builder and igloo builder. Um, so you can see in the lower left, uh, there's some sketches of some people building an igloo and then some people building a house. And then in the right, <clears throat> I started some technical drawings in terms of like how I might build a, uh, a snowboard obstacle rail 
uh, uh, for it. So, which is what I ended up doing during the residency. Uh, and this work, uh, a video that um, I did at the Banff Center and Cheryl helped shoot, uh, was what that Francesca had curated in the show last summer. Uh, and I, I did this work in 2006. So it was really great to have it come back and be uh, in conversation with my more recent work around language, especially as I was processing uh, my Anutatut last name uh, and thinking about that I have this two different sides of me in that like I have an Inuk background and so you see the igloo on the left and then I have like a settler background and my grandfather was a contractor uh, so I grew up very much around the construction like this so I was thinking about those two sides of my family and then I did this performance uh, with it. So um, while I was on the residency and because this work took uh, so very long to create, like it basically took up the, the rest of my seven week residency, like every day focusing on how I was going to like acquire the metal and how to cut it and how to weld it, um, like printing off that large image, like working in Photoshop, all these things, uh, it was an incredibly long process. At the same time, I was making informal sketches, kind of like letting my imagination go where it wanted to uh, with like uh, other uh, skateboard like projects. Uh, and I, I never thought I would create something on a large scale like this, but I was thinking about like something that would be like hundreds of meters long and like thinking about like the landscape and our relationship to it by kind of like making a profile of the landscape uh, in like a steel rail. Um, interestingly, I actually did a very large scale uh, skateboard plaza at Nuit Blanche, Toronto in 2022, uh, just this past October. Uh, I don't have time to talk about it today, but it's interesting that like, uh, I hadn't thought about this, but I was making this sketch about like things on such a massive scale, and I never thought I would end up doing anything like it, but in fact, I, I did. Uh, so that's kind of like an interesting thing for me. Um, anyway, uh, I wanted to bring in this text here briefly and that uh, a manual for decolonization, which uh, is, um, uh, it was something that uh, they, um, uh, that was launched at uh, Emily Carr University of Art and Design in Vancouver, Canada. And I thought that, um, I thought that this text was pretty interesting in terms of a way of framing uh, decolonization. Um, so uh, the indigenous people of this country knew and practiced the intelligent way of living sustainability thousands of years before newcomers arrived. Imagine how much healthier our environment would be if this way of living was respected instead of being viewed as a pagan practice. And I think like uh, uh, a baseline for decolonization being respect for indigenous cultures, uh, like uh, as uh, like one place to work from, uh, was something that was like very important to me. So I started to think about like places where I'd like to see more respect for indigenous culture or places that I thought that I just wanted to be upfront or into uh, what I was doing. Um, so a few years ago, I was talking to a friend and I, I won't get into the entire story. Uh, their name is Mina Campbell and they're incredibly knowledgeable about uh, um, hunting and land-based activities. Uh, I was invited out to their cabin uh, on a hunting trip, 
And one of the things that uh, was really amazing was how much a nutzit became part of the hunting practice, as in the words were still uh, very much in use. Um, Labrador uh, and Nunatsivut has a residential school history. My father went to, through residential school. Uh, when he uh, started there, he didn't speak any English. And like because he went through that process, I never heard him speak a nutzit fluently or really much at all. Uh, so it was really interesting to me to find that uh, through practices of hunting um, and engaging with the land, so much language came out through it. So here uh, you can see the word at the bottom, alu, uh, hole in the ice where seals come up for breath. And here I am uh, waiting patiently over a seal's breathing hole with a harpoon or unak. Uh, to uh, catch a seal. Uh, I caught my first seal on the ice uh, and Mina was there. Uh, I basically just did whatever Mina told me to do. <laughs> and uh, that was what got me to, um, to be successful and then uh, to work with her in order to, into like, um, uh, um, how do you say, um, uh, prepare the seal afterwards or dress the seal afterwards. That's the word I was looking for. Um, I wrote a brief essay on this, and one of the things that I pointed out was that um, it, it was actually the experience of uh, working with Mina and seeing like how much knowledge that they had. And one, one of the other people that was out with us on her hunt was her niece, who was, I think, 15 at the time. So I won't tell you about like how I harpooned my seal because it was like pretty like just barely was able to do it. Whereas her niece uh, so professionally harpooned a seal that when we were dressing the animal, uh, her father found that she had actually harpooned the seal through its heart uh, and, and like was just like so good at um, this traditional practice um, from uh, being raised by not only her, fan, her, her father, but from her auntie. Um, this is from a different hunting trip, but it was one that I did out on foot from a few years ago, and I kind of like made this oil pastel sketch uh, from a photo that I took, uh, kind of thinking about that time, like making our way across the ice in the spring. Uh, this is my uncle's friend, Mickey, uh, that's in the, uh, the mid-ground here. Uh, and then this is some, I just got an iPad and I was really fascinated with the way that the satellite rendering would be stretched across the topographical wireframe maps. And so I made some oil pastels and some uh, oil, can, oil paint on canvas about this, but I found the, the grid kind of unsatisfying about it. Uh, and then working at uh, Emily Carr University of Art and Design, there were so many technical um, uh, things that I could uh, like use. And so one of the things that I did was make custom stencils based on the screenshots that I had. And so here's a, a shot of the laser that's uh, working here. And you can see uh, I was working with an undergraduate student uh, and a technician in order to get this work done. Um, yeah, so what, what we're using here is a, a specific material mylar. It's excellent for uh, making stencils with. Uh, I also made stencils uh, using text. Uh, I wanted to work with text uh, because I wanted to introduce the language into the paintings because I had had this like um, uh, meaningful experience. Uh, and so you can see I'm, I'm cutting out the text here on the left and then I'm processing it. Uh, through a uh, vinyl plotter uh, on the right, and uh, I'm collaging it together and trying out different colors and things. And then I'm kind of going back and forth between analog and digital as I'm, I'm doing this back and forth. Uh, working with further research assistants, uh, I'm helping there, like kind of doing some of these main mundane tasks in the studio in terms of like uh, repeatedly going through each of these different stencil areas. Uh, but in the meantime, we're like having uh, like um, all, all kinds of different conversations, including ones in, uh, like with mentorship. Uh, this is Maggie Day. Um, they're, they're having an amazing career right now. They sold out their first solo show 
and they're continuing to have lots of success in the art world. So uh, one of the things that I like about being a professor is uh, uh, finding opportunities for research assistantships, uh, things that are uh, maybe a little time consuming, but um, uh, where we can have valuable exchanges as well. Uh, this work is called um, uh, seal skin, or that's how it translates. And um, there's a story behind that, but maybe it'll come out later. Uh, this one is hurt knees, which is, there's also a story, and it's about how I hurt my knees <laughs> on that hike. And then this one is a depiction of Hopedale, where my father's uh, home community is, and then it, the, these translate into visit home. And uh, I made over a dozen of these paintings, and they were incredibly time-consuming. I'm not exaggerating when I say that they months and months, and a few of them years. And uh, partly it was just trying to keep straight what the next task was. Um, but I really enjoyed uh, working with the Nutsutu. And I, I took a dictionary that I found online. And I've actually reconnected with the woman that created this dictionary. Um, and I, there's a long story there as well. But I, I, what I did is I, I printed out the dictionary a couple of times. And I took one of the copies and I cut out the words to me that I found interesting. So I'm just looking at this right now, like uh, ponder, isumiak, um, or, or do by trial and error, which becomes part of this other thing. And so like having, looking at these different words that resonated with me and then like collecting them and thinking about what could I do with them. Um, as a painter, I'm really interested in color, and some of you may have taken some color theory. And so you might know that what's being uh, uh, indicated here on the left is uh, the specific um, relationship between um, complementary colors, which is the primary red and the secondary green, and that being the furthest away from each other on the color wheel, they have the most intense relationship. So when you put complementary colors next together, like what we have here in the center, you get very intense color relationships. And these are used, uh, if you look, if you start looking around, you'll see them everywhere. I don't have a blue and orange example right now, except for maybe, uh, uh, you know, like uh, probably around upper state New York in the fall, you know, when the orange leaves are out against the blue sky, it's quite striking. Uh, red and yellow, you have Easter, and then red and green, you have uh, Christmas. Uh, one of the interesting things that I found with kind of studying color a bit better or a bit more is like getting into some nuances like a split complementary. So you, you, you take a primary color or secondary color, and then rather than going right for the most intense relationship, like just take the intensity out of it for a second and just move a little bit to the side. And with that subtlety, uh, you can have much more interesting color relationships. And where I spent um, uh, months creating those canvases with oil paint, uh, I shifted and started to work with spray paint and would come up with the color combinations that I would finish in seconds. So uh, I have a little video here, part of the end part of the process. Um, and this, this word translates into take a good look. And you can see like a little bit closer here, like how I'm trying to work with that, the subtleties between the two different kinds of blue and then like kind of an orangey peach color, uh, which would be on the other side of the uh, color wheel from there. Uh, and then working with that um, principle or that structure of a split complementary allowed me to create this wall-based installation, where I was very happy with how all the different colors worked out. And if there's any painters in the audience, I'm sure you can attest that making uh, really colorful works uh, on a canvas work out, it's not a simple thing to do. So what I did was I, I went back to uh, color principles in order to do this. And then um, they didn't all succeed. Like I made like maybe 20, five or 26 of these. And so I kind of like cut down from this like thing of 20. But then there's that word at the top, uh, like the blue one here, uh, utgak, which is do by trial and error. And then um, down on the lower, uh, on the bottom row, 
near the uh, left is Pusagok, which actually translates into fall on one's face. And so I thought it was interesting to use all these words that are related to um, uh, discovery, learning, um, effort, and uh, put them all into one place, like thinking about like how there's so much learning that goes on in a skateboarding practice and an art practice and a learning language practice that takes falling on your face, that takes trial and error, or ulukuk, which is like uh, waking up early in the morning, you know, like all these different things that all are part of a learning practice. Um, so this is the show that uh, Francesca invited me to, uh, Katingak, and uh, the video is installed in the on the back, and then uh, this series uh, of pastel boards is uh, called um, Quiet uh, or Soft Spoken. Uh, and I wanted to kind of play with like that visual translation of noise or volume. Uh, so the other the other series was outspoken, and then this one is quiet. And so it's kind of like the same theme of learning, but with a different kind of tenor in how um, in how the words were coming across. And then uh, these ones I both did in 2021. And then this was done anew in 2022. Uh, and so with this set of boards, um, I created my own custom stencils, very similar to the uh, landscape stencils that you'd seen before with the laser cutter. And yet with these ones, rather than it being about my own personal learning, uh, all of these words translate into experience of experiences I had learning with somebody else. So uh, in the center here, Kanek, uh, Pinyuk, uh, that's uh, snow play, and that's like in reference to the snowboarding video that I did. And I was thinking about my friend Cheryl Rondell, who was a big part of that process. And then here in the lower right, uh, we have Atsuk Uluguk, which is exert yourself in the morning. And that was like funny. I was working with a um, another um, uh, research assistant for this work who did all the the background colors and a lot of the the test papers on this. And while I was coordinating with him, uh, it's Colin Canary, who's a brilliant painter in our MFA program at Concordia. Um, uh, I was like, okay, so when are you available? He's like, well, I got to hit the gym in the morning and then I'll be in. And uh, I try and stay like in as best kind of like physical and mental health as I can. And so I just love that. So I, I wanted to capture that moment and translate it into a nutta. And there's a story behind each of these and they're each like kind of honoring uh, a collaboration that I had with someone else uh, where I learned through the process. Um, and then this is really a labor of love. Uh, it is thinking about um, uh, picking berries in the fall. And what it was is I was with my partner in the fall and I had this deadline to make this work for the show. And we like uh, foraged some pears together. And it reminded me just like the weather, uh, the time of year, uh, reminded me about berry picking back in Labrador and in Newfoundland. And so each of these reference a, a specific kind of berry that you could forage. And so uh, as you can see, it's the uh, bake apple, um, blackberry or cloud or crowberry, uh, the uh, lindenberry or partridge berry, and then the blueberry. And so what I was looking for is like um, the rich color in each of them, but also some subtlety as well. So like for the epic, um, you get some of this like light peachy color from the leaves in the drop shadow and similarly in the blueberry you get like a bit of a pink in the drop shadow and then anyway I, I could go on about the different color choices that I've made but um uh yeah I just love the set here okay we're doing pretty good on time um I think I want to show you just the one other skateboard project where I was bringing a uh, Nut and Migma into um, into a project where I went back to Prince Edward Island for that art festival again. Oh, if I click on this though, I'm gonna have to do a different screen share. Okay, I'll tell you what, if we have time, we'll come back to this and we'll look at the skateboarding, but it was just some amazing skateboarding um, from uh, the uh, skateboard community in Prince Edward Island. And uh, what was really cool was um, one of the skateboarders uh, was uh, a Mi'kmaq 
uh, skater. And so it was like their indigenous language and my indigenous language together on, on uh, one board and like being able to kind of experience indigenous language in the landscape that it's from, uh, I thought was a really fun collaboration or really fun uh, project to do with the skateboarders in Prince Edward Island to think about indigenous language in the place that it's from. Um, uh, this is actually back from when I was sketching at the Banff Center uh, and like I'm thinking about um, you know hunting practices and the kayak and as you can see here I don't really have a grasp of how a kayak actually comes together um, but uh, I did work at the Labrador Interpretation Center with my friend Mina as the curator, uh, and I did get to talk about this kayak, which is a actual, like, um, uh, uh, used to be a functional kayak, seal skin kayak that was, like, used on the coast of Labrador or Unatsi of it, and um, part of that, like, thinking about the kayak brought me to doing an online search and finding a, a huge set of images of, um, of kayakers from Okok, which was a community that uh, closed down when the Spanish flu pandemic uh, came to Labrador and killed hundreds of people. Um, but okay, before, before the pandemic, sorry, I don't want to trigger anyone the like, pandemic talk. Uh, but um, anyway, um, uh, I felt a real connection to this imagery when I came across it, and I didn't feel like I was going to be on the internet and make a kind of connection like that, but this work really spoke to me, and I wanted to kind of work with it as a painter, and part of it was I was doing a little, a lot of grisaille paintings at the time, and then it really kind of just fit with what I was doing with my paintbrush. Um, thinking about uh, that text that I brought up earlier and my extended family, uh, I, this quote really resonated for me. The voices of our ancestors continue to call out to us, telling that it's all about the land, always has been, always will be, get back to it, go back to it. We fought for the land and for our connection to it for 500 years. It's the struggle to restore the living relationship between our ancestors, our land, and ourselves that has defined us as Indigenous people. And so I think that like restoring a living relationship, it's engaging with Indigenous language. I'm not trying to be a fluent speaker because I don't know if I'll ever achieve that in my lifetime, but that doesn't mean that I can't take ownership of my Indigenous language and, and use it and engage it with it in my work. And then another way to kind of like engage for me and to involve myself in the landscape in an Indigenous way was to take up kayaking and to take ownership of it in an Indigenous person. And while I was living in Vancouver, I was really um, uh, taken by how much kayaking culture was there in the city. And so I got in on that. Um, and it was my way of kind of like thinking about, again, like taking back like to from uh, something that had been so um, uh, commodified or so co-opted or maybe losing some of that Indigenous connection. And so I wanted to kind of reintroduce an uh, in, uh, Indigenous kind of perspective to it. At first, I tried to like work at it as an art instructor and made charcoal drawings, but really it was a performance that helped tie this together better.
Um, it, time's getting a bit long, so uh, I love to talk about the connection between skateboarding and uh, learning this uh, maneuver. Um, but I, I just want to say, like, for me, that kind of making a connection to the land and making a connection to my ancestry, I really felt that, like, in learning this maneuver. Um, and with that, oops, what's going on? Oh, uh, I think about uh, my grandmother and her uh, pleasure in thinking about um, having a, an active engagement, uh, being outside and enjoying oneself in the landscape. And that's something that I've tried to bring into a lot of my different work. And I love seeing that connection between um, that historical imagery and then what I'm doing right now. Uh, Nakami, thank you very much. All right. Hi. Hi, Francesca. Thank you so much. That was such a wonderful presentation, Mark. And every time I hear you talk about your work, there are just like more and more insights on, you know, like all of the different layers. Um, I find that, especially as Indigenous makers, um, our work can really be like put in context of like, this is decolonial in the way that it educates like non-Indigenous communities about this thing or this thing. And just like being able to hear you speak, I think like on four or five different occasions and just like our own conversations, it's um, it's just really, really wonderful. Um, I am really happy and excited to see you like including your teaching practice within like how you how you talk about your work and you know, this idea of failure. And um, I do want to create like a couple of threads between um, your work and Frederick Church's. I think one of the questions kind of addressed it. Um, but the this idea of like the difference between surveying the land and like, I'm pretty sure that one of your series is literally called Traverse. Yeah. And like, what does it mean to traverse the land? And so like one of your quotes, you talk about like the rigidity of like nails and screws not being um, not being suitable and and like as a result, like unfit to like be in contact um, as you travel the land. And so what how do you see these connections between like your relationship to land? Um, traversing the land versus like a documentation which like you talked a little bit about the tensions between um topography and painting and like how mm -hmm. difficult that was yeah uh it was between traversing and um doc like like a survey perhaps yeah, um, so Frederick Churchill's work within yeah. the exhibition is, I think, like quite accurately described as a survey. Um, yeah. And like to what it means to like create, to depict an art, to depict landscape mm -hmm. as like a two dimensional object versus something that you're like in relation with. Yeah, and I think like um, one of the things I really liked about the, uh, I called it the rendering series, the ones with the um, the landscape and the text and like thinking about the topographical map. Um, there's a couple of things I really loved about um, using that imagery. And one is that like, it, it kind of like talks about the surface quality of a painting, you know, that it's all image, like it has a two dimensional quality, right? So the, the wireframe, is a representation of three dimensionality, but then it also reminds us that what we're looking at is quite flat. And that um, the other thing that I thought was kind of ingenious about the iPad map application at the time was that it was taking satellite imagery and stretching it over uh, a topographical wireframe, right? And if anybody here has taken a figure drawing class, you know that you employ like different strategies in order to come up with a representation. Right. So uh, translating that lived three dimensional experience into a still 
uh, two-dimensional experience, you would say use contour and gesture and um, uh, different kinds of textures and things like that and shading. And so all of those different ways of thinking would come together and form a representation. Um, whereas it's it's kind of similar to what the um, uh, the satellite imagery is doing as well, right? Uh, the satellite imagery, you know, is very much about surveying the land and like um, all these other like tactical reasons that, you know, like governments build these very, very expensive satellites with these very, very complex like imagery. Um, and a lot of it is around extraction, right? So um, the, uh, the, the, the salmon skin one, I think it's like silk, uh, I can't remember the pronunciation right now, but the translation of the word is uh, seal, uh, salmon skin. And that was something that one of our political leaders, uh, Natan Obed, um, you know, used to reference what our land claims deal was, which didn't co cover anything subsurface. So it's like, he said, it's like the analogy was like, it's like having the skin of the salmon, but not the meat, right? And of course, he's talking about like the, where the money is going to go and things like that. But it's an interesting relationship to land that our um, our land claim agreement, uh, it is, um, it's surface level, right? And so then thinking about the uh, a painting being surface level as well, is things that I was trying to like process as making those, those um, month long works. I think um, another element of the question addresses uh, color. And so mm -hmm. some of the relationships that I see within your work and also just like conversations that um, I've heard like Inuit curators, I think actually your sister Heather um, yeah. have on panels about like this presumed whiteness of the North capital N. Yeah. Um, and so, to see your work also in conversation with your grandmother's embroidery and to see like this tradition of um, Inuit, Inuit cultural production, Nunatsiavut cultural production as like really colorful, beautiful, um, and also being reflective of the nature around us, like those berry boards. Um, yeah. Are you... The, the the question in the Q and A was, were you was the resonance between um, your use of color? Did it come from your environment? And then they made a similar connection to um, Winston Churchill and like was Winston Churchill? I looking at the icebergs, they're a little bit lighter than. Oh yeah, <laughs> they're all quite cool colors, but I think like in terms of vibrancy and. I don't think most people would anticipate seeing and and knowing that that type of vibrancy is around Goose, Happy Valley Goose Bay or yeah. Um, oh, well, I keep saying Winston Churchill because of like I know I know I was Frederick Church. Frederick Church. Winston Churchill painted himself. I, I know. <laughs> so that's not it's not that far off. He may have some northern paintings, uh, but but for Frederick Church and well, my relationship to paint uh, to color. Um, I was very much, um, like working in, like, say I, when I engaged with painting after my undergraduate thing, so like for my, for my own, uh, and when I was at the BAM center, I was very much like just working in grisaille, right? Just like in shades of gray. And it was because I really wanted to get a feel for the paint and I wanted to get a feel for the brushwork and I wanted to get a feel for rendering. And for me, like, I just needed to kind of like limit myself and kind of process things that way. And one of the things that that just kind of like serendipitously happened was that I found those black and white images and like immediately was a already kind of like um, moving forward in that kind of vein. And so like, I was like, I really had something to work with there. And then um, immediately after that, I was working in like local color. So like you, you look at, I'm looking at like a book on a shelf right now. So the shelf would be brown, the book would be like yellow, you know? And then I wasn't really kind of like imagining with color at the time. And um, uh, I was kind of like just working in that vein, like not really sure what I was doing with color. And then um, I had made that video, uh, the Eskimo roll, 
And uh, I put it in an exhibition at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. Uh, it was Border X that Jamie Isaac had curated. And I was really kind of looking over my shoulder thinking like, um, you know, does this make sense? Like, does this video of me in a fiberglass uh, kayak make sense? You know, it's, it's bright yellow. Like, is this really a thing? And when that show was hung, um, like the largest collection of Inuit art in the world is at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. And so uh, I happened to go like around the corner from like all of the people and the excitement of the opening. And I went to the uh, Inuit art exhibit and there was a print there from Baker Lake and um, Luke Agnaka uh, had one of his prints and it was three kayakers in bright yellow kayaks you know, and, and it was just the color he chose. And that for me, like felt like a real kind of um, connection to, um, to color and to like this ancestral background and a kind of affirmation that um, the way I was working was meaningful and that um, rather than thinking it was artificial or, or something uh, that was um, a put on or something like that, that it was actually very meaningful uh, that what I was doing, which is a great affirmation because there are people out there, believe it or not, that have told me that they don't think what, I, what I'm doing is worthwhile, you know, it, it's just, I don't know, it, it's probably something to do with like just reaching any level of success. There's people out there that want to uh, I don't know, they can't deal with it for whatever reason. Uh, and, um, and but like, that's not something that I want to be paying attention to. It's more like having something be like, uh, so validating to me because of the connection that I made with it. Uh, and then to kind of keep moving forward, uh, despite uh, what people might say. Uh, that exhibition uh, that I that I had before uh, the one that we did, um, with the two different series, the outspoken and quiet on two different walls. So like 40 different skateboards, um, that work was that the title of that work was Anita, right? And Anita translates into this above all negations, right? And I was thinking about how, um, you know, uh, people that move in the world, uh, trying to get things done, uh, there's people out there that may try and negate that work. Uh, because of whatever reason, who knows, right? And so for me, like finding that word, that powerful word in my language, um, and just like, you know, like that, a, a way of looking at things and like not being dragged down by those kind of opinions uh, was something incredibly powerful for me and something that I was like, so happy to kind of like title that work, that work with, just kind of like defending off any like doubt that might come from somewhere else yeah I think this um this journey um that you've done like through your work and and seeing those through lines from the work that you made all the way back in 2006 yeah. to like what's happening now the, the the idea of like travel and time um is and also failure you know yeah I think like coming to a place where you are like I might never be a fluent speaker yeah I'm going to still take time and I'm going to continue to like move across the land and learn the words for my land yeah and and like when I use the word land, it's not exclusively just um, words for like also the water. Um, yeah. Like that um, I think is really important. And and to have that dedication to, to those processes of learning and also those processes of sharing and sharing space. Um, I thought it was really poignant that you had included a story about learning from your student um yeah as as another aspect um I did want to talk a little bit about digital spaces and physical spaces we have like a couple of minutes left um yeah. but there's a move that you have going towards rendering um natural spaces specifically within uh, Nuit Blanche 
Toronto um, yeah. of having fish swimming with you and moving with you um, within a city center. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts about um, the integration of that. Yeah, um, I, I, I went a little long and I thought if I got into my new Blanche work, it would be a while because it takes some explaining. Uh, but um, I was so, so uh, happy with that work. And, you know, like hundreds of skateboarders came out, thousands of viewers. Uh, it was such a spectacular event. Uh, and um, there was so much like, like love and positive energy uh, from that skateboarding community. And the inspiration for it was the saputit or uh, fishware. And uh, the idea of the fishware is you create a corral in a low uh, running river uh, that you can wade into and the corral of rocks um, uh, becomes a way that you can then harvest the fish, right? Uh, what I thought was that this was going to be a project about movement. You got the movement of the skateboards, you have the movement of the skateboarders' bodies, you have the movement of the water, and then you have the movement of the fish, you have the movement of the boards, like flipping and spinning under people, uh, like at the same kind of space where like the fish would be like flipping and spinning around. Um, and so the idea of, of bringing the fish into that space with augmented reality was a way of kind of like thinking about uh, um, this kind of movement that happens in the natural environment and the excitement of movement and like how uh, wonderful it is, you know, that things can dart around like that and the skateboarders can dart around. Uh, but what became much more important about that project was community. And I, I realized like through watching videos about the saputi and seeing people harvest fish, it wasn't individuals harvesting fish, it's the whole community comes out and harvests fish. And there's like, um, if you look at like um, uh, Fish Weir on YouTube or something, uh, there's this archival footage and there's a woman that's wearing her amouti, like so her, um, her coat for like carrying a baby. Uh, and the baby's in her back and she's like harpooning fish with everyone else. You know, the whole community's out, the whole community's participating. And so for Nuit Blanche Toronto, uh, what we did with uh, artistic director Julie Nagum is we spent a lot of time doing extra programming. Like, so there was the Night of Nuit Blanche, which was a free for all. And it was amazing, like just so much activity. Uh, but then there was an extended program for a week where we engaged with uh, community groups uh, that were involved with skateboarding. So uh, we flew in um, uh, uh, some Indigenous skateboarders, uh, Joe Buffalo, Rosie Archie from Colonialism Skateboards, uh, and uh, Nation Skate Youth. Uh, it's a nonprofit. Uh, and they hosted a an, an Indigenous skateboard session for Indigenous people of Toronto. Uh, Queer Skate Toronto made a space for um, uh, like their community, which included a lot of learners, and it also included a lot of like uh, just rippers. And it was just amazing to see like the community that Queer Skate had uh, created in Toronto and brought together all these wonderfully diverse people into the space. And then we had uh, a hosted session um, by Auntie Skates, who's a TikTok star, and um, uh, later Skaters Gang. So it's like people that are learning to skateboard in their 30s and 40s and 50s and maybe 60s, I don't know. And also we had a hosted session by Impact Skate Club. Uh, Yaz is a person of color and he brought in all of his youth. Uh, Babes Brigade, uh, female owned skateboard train company hosted a session and they brought in all their people, including some young women. And uh, the whole week of activity was so community orientated, it was just fabulous. And so, um, I think your initial question was about fish and how that all came in. I think like the the fish related to the movement and it related to making this connection between like the indigenous space in Toronto, but then it was also uh, really about like, okay, what brings us together and what forms community? So in the Saputi, like traditional, it'd be like harvesting fish. And then in the Saputi Nuit Blanche, it would be like sharing uh, a passion for skateboarding. That's amazing. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, I think Carolyn's going to pop in and ask for any last questions. We might go over a little bit. 
Yeah, but, thank um, you so much, Francis. Thank you so much to you both. I do not want to cut this conversation short because I'm really, really enjoying listening to you both. But I just want to let everyone know that we are at seven. So if anyone needs to pop off, please feel free. Um, and if you have any remaining questions, please, please feel free to, to chime in. I know that we got um, just a question from Karen Zukowski asking a little bit about um, your draftsmanship, uh, Mark. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about, about that and about kind of choosing that material and that process for your work. Um, I think we were also, at least I'll speak for myself, so excited to see your range of modalities that you're using in your artwork. And I don't know if you want to highlight a little bit more about your specific choice making related to um, related to draftsmanship. Yeah, and Francesca, please feel free to chime in as well, of course. Yeah, I, in my classes, I like to say draftspersonship. You know, like uh, there's a lot of gender assumptions and like working at, I worked at Emily Carr for uh, seven years and, or sorry, no, probably six years. And um, one of the things that when we moved into a new building, we had genderless uh, bathrooms and it was such an amazing kind of progressive move for uh, the city. And so I, I like to try to be aware, especially when I'm working with my students about like gender, uh, gendered um uh, language. And so I have a bad habit of saying you guys, but I, I usually switch. I usually catch myself and say you folks. Uh, and then whenever I'm in a drawing class, I do make an effort to say draftspersonship. Um, so for me, like thinking about something like draftspersonship, um, you know, I, I'm often trying to find like the right or appropriate way of doing things because or, or a solution, maybe not right, but like effective. And um, this idea of failure that Francesca had brought up, like it's something that I'm encountering constantly uh, and I'm, I'm in a real funk right now, if I was to be honest. Um, but uh, a part of it is like uh, persevering and like uh, finding um, uh, solutions that work. So say uh, when I showed the oil pastel with the topographical map and the oil painting that did the same, uh, the way I was using the brush, I could not have the precision that I wanted in order to make that um, effective translation of like that, that grid. I wanted that rigidity and I also wanted that flow and I wanted like all kinds of different visual things to happen that was happening on the screen that I couldn't make happen on the canvas. And so um, painting is such a wonderful meaning, uh, medium because it stretches back to like the very beginning of human history and then it's still working with uh, the most latest technology right now. So you, it's one of the things I love about painting is you can throw anything at it. And so uh, for me, the solution was to uh, make custom laser cut stencils uh, because of the precision, because of the scale, um, uh, because of the solution. Uh, that that offered, you know, and then uh, for something like um, the, uh, I was making my own stencils uh, for the text and you saw how I had my X-Acto knife, I was cutting out every letter, I was photographing it, scaling it, uh, putting on the plotter, attaching it to the canvas, uh, covering it with the base color paint, waiting weeks for it to dry, and so on and so on and so on. And then I was just like, I was making all these on my own letters. I was like, wait, I could just go to the hardware store and buy letter stencils. Like it exists. It's it's ten dollars, you know, and then for the color, I, I could get spray paint. I could be done in seconds, you know. So with whatever the, the question is in terms of draftspersonship or like how I'm trying to effectively make a painting or effectively make an artwork. It's kind of a question of like what's appropriate and what's going to work. And yes, the failure, the frustration, the like, like, oh my God, like I can't believe I'm coming in the studio to work on this painting again. And it's just like inching along. Like that series literally took me like three years to finish like a dozen paintings. And um, so then to kind of go to like just producing 40 paintings in a number of weeks thinking about like the principles of um, color theory as a way of navigating that space just so I could effectively make my way through it and survive uh, was what I was thinking about that. Well, survive and also like make something that expressed that exuberance and the excitement that I had in the colorful and spoken piece. And then to even shift and like think about things of more subtlety and more softly with the, uh, the, the quiet piece when the pastel work. 
It's a great question. Francesca, I wonder if I could kind of, you know, I know that we're short on time, so anyone who needs to pop off, please do. But I wonder if we could revisit and if I could pose a question to you both, um, kind of jumping off of Sean Sawyer's question that came through about color theory, because that was something that I was so struck by as well. Um, and, you know, when we were thinking a little bit about Frederick Church and how inter in invested and interested he was in color theory and chromatics in the 19th century, I guess a question that I would have for you both in your respective work as, a, as an artist and as a curator is, you know, what is the current power of color? Church was so drawn and so um, fascinated by the studies of Ogden Rood, and he kind of went specifically to the Arctic for that, I think, in a very uh, 19th century explorer, painter, um, sort of realm and in that it, very much in that schema but for contemporary artists what can color do now and Mark I'm sure you could talk at length about this but Francesca and your work with Mark or other artists I'm just curious um, a, an open question to you both I think color is as culturally informed as um this might not be like groundbreaking at all, but um, as culturally informed as like symbolism that um, we use every day to like read artworks from a Euro Western lens. Um, and to be able to articulate and to be able to like understand what that like visual legacy of color is. Um, the resonances between Marx work and Frederick Church, his work, fourth time's the charm. Um, I think that comes from, you know, the professionalization of art, the professionalization of painting um, as a discipline, um, but also just like if you look at indigenous cultural production across the country, um, if you look at um, beadwork, if you look at textiles, if you look at the piece of embroidery that Mark's grandmother did. I'm obsessed with it. It's the first time I saw it today. Um, I'm also obsessed with it, yes. <laughs> right? Um, these, these are part of like a longer visual language. And so like if you look through anthropological texts or like through museum records that talk about color choices or like contextualize them, there's this like idea around scarcity and that color choices are made with what materials are available. And that is like the limit of the discussion around um, those, those, those artistic decisions. Um, and so it also becomes like a relationship when you're working with natural materials of like you and the land. What does it mean to dye um, quills or to dye um, beads that were made with like bird feather um the main part to to have to go and collect those um those plants and to be in a space where you are surrounded by the product of the land and and your your territory so um i think the the relationship between color is very 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 powerful to the point that you can't make anything as an indigenous artist in red without having like some callback to missing and murdered indigenous women now. Um, red is a color of power in the prairies, like as an Anishinaabe person. Um, and so I think um, there's two conversations happening where when we are making work and looking towards our family members, like the way that Mark does, or as we are like moving through these professionalized training spaces, um, academic institutions, um, we're, we're having two conversations at the same time. And yeah, it's really exciting. I'm not sure if that totally answered your question. No, but like, I think all the color theory is like, <laughs> Yeah, Francesca, I think to that point, I mean, just thinking about this, this sci scientific understanding of color versus this understanding of color from being in the land. I mean, that, that um, those two dualities are really standing out to me in a way that they weren't before. So thank you for that. Um, Mark, 
do you want to take a stab before you wrap up? I know we're kind of getting close to um, 7.15. So any final calls for questions? And definitely, I want to leave some time for you to address the color topic in the room. Um, I think like, uh, but if anybody wanted to kind of like go back and reflect on like the my comments on split complementary and, and the color yellow, <laughs> I uh, that that's all I would say in that like, um, it, it, those two things were just very important to me. And um, I just really appreciate Francesca's comments and this question and answer period altogether. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, once again, Carolyn uh, and Gracie for hosting me uh, with the Orlando or hosting Francesca and I. And I'd like to sincerely thank Francesca uh, for uh, her very thoughtful questions. And uh, once again, the uh, show that we had in Winnipeg, it meant a lot to me to uh, to be able to kind of like publicly think about those works and uh, their curatorial work uh, was top notch. So uh, thank you very much, Francesca. Thank you so much. Thank you both for joining us and thank you for everybody tuning in and those who hung around. Um, we will be posting a recording of this webinar on our website. So please feel free to send some, you know, keep an eye out for that and send it around um, and stay tuned for more coming from both of our wonderful guests this evening. Thank you. Thank you.